Okay, let's talk about spring potential energy here. Um, let me get a pen going. So what is on the screen here is this is a uh, is a graph showing data points um, for an experiment where you guys were basically taking springs. Okay, there, there's my spring, and you were hanging them from a ring stand, and you were placing uh, known masses on there, and you were measuring how much extension you got based on how much mass was attached. You were then converting that mass using um, FG equals mg into a downward force. And what that resulted in was a graph showing force here in newtons and displacement here in meters. Okay, so the displacement is how far the spring actually stretched. So the delta stretch of the spring, its resting length you were considering to be zero. Okay. Uh, this is a line of best fit for the data points across uh, two students groups. And so now we're going to use this to talk about first Hooke's law, and then we'll talk about uh, how we can, you know, use this kind of understanding to talk about the potential energy that you end up getting um, in a spring. So the first thing <clears throat> that we want to talk about is the fact that the slope of this is meaningful. Okay, the slope of this line is meaningful. So if you take a look and let's just get a color that's a little more visible here okay this is you know the change in in y value or the rise right um and down here okay we have the run or the or the change in x value okay it's pretty clear that you more or less are going to get a linear relationship i mean there's some variation because it's real data but you have a line of best fit and this is the slope that you're interested in this is M. So we sort of have talked about this already a little bit before um, the lecture, but what we're saying here is that there is a direct relationship between the amount of force applied to a spring and the extension that you're going to get. Okay? This concept that this value is linear is called Hooke's Law. Okay? So Hooke's Law says that within a region of a spring, you will find this direct relationship between force applied and extension. If you go beyond, you say start to apply force that's too high, you'll get outside the elastic limits and Hooke's law will no longer be true, right? This will start to, to kink over. And I'm sure everyone's taken a spring and wrenched it hard and put it out of shape and it won't go back. Once you breach the elastic limits um, of the spring, it no longer behaves in this linear fashion. So we found for the particular spring <clears throat> that we used um, that we got a slope of this equal to uh, roughly 79 newtons per meter. Okay. This is specific for the spring we used. If we used a lighter spring, okay, we would have got a much smaller value. We would have got a lower slope. Okay. If we used a heavier spring, we got a much higher value, something over here. Okay. So a slope. Um, on this graph represents what's called Hooke's constant, and it's different for every spring that you're going to use. Again, for our spring, it's 72. Okay, Hooke's constant is designated as k. Okay, and that's important because it's going to come into a formula we're going to discover here in a minute. So what we can say then from this graph, it's following the type y equals mx plus b. Right, it's a linear relationship. B is zero. There's no intercept because when there's no weight on the spring, its extension is zero, right? So we're expecting no extension there. In this case, Y represents the force. M represents the slope. Hooke's constant, so we call that K. And X, well, actually represents a displacement, which we'll leave as being X. Um, technically, though, in IB, uh, displacements aren't written as x. What are they written as? Yeah. So you might see it written like this. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Perfect. Now, that's pretty simple. That's a simple direct relationship that I think you can all wrap your heads around. 
However, let's think about what had to happen to make this true. Or, or let's turn it on its ear, actually, and that might help us uh, understand what's next. So let's imagine that we have a spring. And this spring is now on its side. Okay. And we are stretching the spring out to here. Okay. So here's our delta S. Okay. And it probably makes most sense to put a delta here because we're talking about a change in stretch. So just realize that there's probably a delta in there as well. So let's just rewrite that with a delta. <laughs> just to be all fully like honest with, uh, with what we'll probably see when we're when we're looking these things up. Okay. So here's your change. What do I have to do in order to make this change happen? I have to apply a what to make this happen. Yeah, I gotta do I gotta do a force, right? I gotta apply a force, and that amount of force is not constant, right? That force has to increase, right? So that's where these values are. I mean, a little more force, a little more force, a little more force, and so on increases the x value. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Um, so it's not quite if we're talking now about work, right? It's not quite as simple as say lifting something straight up, where the same amount of force is applied over the whole distance a changing force is applied over this distance, right? Now, that might start setting off calculus bells in your head, but don't worry. Okay, we can sidestep that. So let's um let's talk about the work done in making this this spring stretch, okay? So the first thing that we should talk about, if we go back over here and we'll use this as an example is what does the what does the, the the rise represent here? The rise represents what again? What do we what do we plot right? Force, good. And so if we write that down back to our pen. If we write that down that, that represents force. Okay. We also know that force is equal to kx. Could we say that this rise is equal to delta kx or k delta x? Can we say that? Is that okay to say that? Since force is equal to kx, let's just say that this rise that we're talking about for this particular thing is equal to kx. So far so good? And this is x down here, right? That's not going to change. So we've got x down here. But if we're talking about the work, what on this graph represents the work that we did? What about this area? Or uh, what about this? Ah, uh, good. I accidentally said the magic word. Okay, so what we should understand here is that it. What we're looking at is if, if we want if we want to do work, we know that work is force times distance. We've learned that before. Or in this case, work equals force times s nomenclature hey catches yeah okay and that's also s <laughs> just to add some confusion to the whole thing okay what we should say then is we should say then okay force right times displacement force times displacement is the work and and force times displacement is this area underneath this this graph here, right? So the work should be the area under this whole entire graph. That's what we're after when we're talking about work. So the question now is, how are we going to go about calculating the area under this graph? What would we do to find the work done while moving this spring? How do we find this area? What do you think? Good. Half base times height. Okay, but we're just going to change that a little bit. So what we're going to say is we're going to say the work done to stretch the spring is going to be equal to one half, okay, height, base times height or height times base shouldn't really matter, k s times s, right? So this is force, and this is extension, but we're putting force in terms of k s, right? So we might not know the actual direct force. So we get work equals one half KSS. Or rewritten, the work 
to stretch this spring. One half k s squared. Or if I do this amount of work, I know that within the laws of thermodynamics, all of that work, except for a little bit, disclaimer, but in the ideal physical world, all of it gets converted into spring or elastic potential energy. So EE equals one half K S squared. This is the law of spring potential energy, or the, or the formula talking about spring potential. Okay, so all you need to know is you need to know the hook constant for the spring and you need to know how far you're going to stretch it and that will tell you how much energy is uh, locked up inside the spring so what can you use this for let's use it for something let's use it for something good <laughs> let's do a little problem with this let's make one up can you guys see that yet see that. okay so problem um a spring why don't you even make it this spring? Hooks constant. So a spring with a hooks constant of 74 newtons per meter is compressed. by, I don't know, 18 centimeters. A small ball is then launched by the spring along a track. What is the theoretical max height reached by the ball? It has a mass of 10 grams. So I'll show you what I'm what I have in mind here. Okay. Um, so instead of a stretch spring, we're going to use it as a uh, compression spring, okay? Just, just to make it easier to understand. Uh, so here's our spring. Oh, it certainly does. Yep, it applies to compression and to um, extension it, it, um, equally well, okay? So what we're saying is we're compressing this spring by 18 centimeters, okay? Yeah, we'll get there in a sec. And let's say we have a track. Is that too sharp for you? Okay. I want to know, you know, if I've drawn this correctly, if I release this ball, well, yeah, so theoretical would be in a frictionless world. Okay. Yeah, oh yeah, we can make the problem even harder. We can put friction in here if you really want to. <laughs> but we won't, okay? When we let this ball go, um, yeah, and friction, that's a good point. Friction will do work, right, to, to slow this ball down, essentially, right? It'll apply a force over the distance that the ball travels, right? So it will work to slow this down, but let's ignore that for now. So essentially what we're saying here, right, is we're going to use the law of conservation of energy. We're going to say no energy is ever created or destroyed, okay? Of course, we have to respect the other part of thermodynamics, which says that all of this energy cannot be converted, but we're going to disrespect that for now, okay? And what we're going to say is, we're going to say our elastic potential energy is all getting converted into gravitational potential energy. Oh, yeah.
data, yes, you'd have to do it experimentally, right? You'd have to figure it out with experiment. I mean, we don't know what these surfaces are made of. We have no, co no concept of any of that because I mean, it's a made-up problem. If you were to do this in real life, you would actually do it in reverse. You would say, theoretically, it should go this high, but it only goes that high. How efficiently did I convert spring potential energy to gravitational potential energy? And I would say it's probably not highly efficient, really. It's probably maybe 70%. Maybe less? Maybe that's an experiment you could try sometime. Wink. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, uh, spring potential energy. Well, we just learned that can be calculated as 1 half kx squared. What was our formula for finding gravitational potential energy? All right. Try this. You know, so many years of using x, and now they want me to use s. It's hard. Okay. Um, how does this work? What did we figure out that spring potential or that gravitational potential energy is worked out as? Well, it's gravitational force times how high it goes, right? So we can call that height. And this again, right, force times distance, that's the amount of work. If we do that amount of work, we should store that amount of energy. How do we calculate the force of gravity? G, right? So it should be M G H. Okay? You might want to call this S as well, um, but remember, it's a different value. Okay? This is the compression of the spring. This is the height that we can expect the ball to get to. So we are actually after this value. So a quick little bit of um, algebra should give you that the height this gets to is 1 half ks squared over mg. So let's put some values in. 1 half 74 newtons per meter. And what did we say S was? 18 centimeters. So this is 0 0.18 meters all squared. Divided by the mass of the ball, which I think was 10 grams. So 0 0.01 kilograms. Uh, times gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, would I not round what? Yeah, probably if I was doing this with real measurements, I would include uncertainty and I would include rounding, but I'm just making stuff up here. So I'm not too concerned with, um, with all my rounding at this point, okay? So let's solve this and we'll be right back. So it looks like the consensus is that we would get this ball flying up in the air. Oh, I wanted a different color. 12.2 meters. Okay. Um, and I guess one sig fig maybe. <laughs> so I think I think we left I think we left it at 12. We'd be fine. There. Okay. So 12 meters. Does that make sense? All right. Done. Spring potential energy.